Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Ethington. And I'm Nick Nicholas. And this is From Akron and Beyond. Welcome to this episode, and we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Jim Carney. Uh, When I was thinking about the whole premise of our podcast, From Akron and Beyond, it kind of occurred to me that no one I know is more Akron than Jim Carney. He epitomizes (laughs) Akron, truly. He really does. And so, hello, Jim. Hey, guys. Very good to be here with you. You know, Jimmy, it's been probably... More than 50 years when I first met you, at, uh, you and me and a bunch of other guys uh, hanging around uh, Akron News Radio. What, what was that? Where were the call letters? W-A-U-P. W-A-U-P. Yeah. Every, you know, all the cool guys w- would be there, you know. And, and, uh, some and of my, Jim. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was sort of yeah. that. Some <laughs> of my people became my closest friends, you know, I, I, I met at the radio station. And, uh, and, you know, so we go back a ways. Yeah, those those were really interesting days for me. Um, I only was a, I was a psych major at Akron U, and I realized that there's I I probably needed institutionalized more than anything, <laughs> but I, I discovered the radio station, and a friend of mine was volunteering and said you can, you can go over there and and ask him if you can work, which I did. And my memory is that it was around May fourth. Okay. Oh, yeah. And I was went in there, and the wire machine was, you know, pumping out all this stuff about Kent State. Right. Anyway, I started volunteering down there, and I I found my, I, I found a group of people that I gelled with, you know, and that that had common interests, and you know, it was a very very important thing for me, the radio station, and I took it from there, and you know, here we are. And you know, a cool thing about the radio station, it was like a mini version of the freeform radio stations around the country because each DJ had his own, you know, niche, you know, but it was all great stuff that you couldn't hear on, on uh, normal radio. Well, at the time, there were a couple, uh, you know, WNCR and MMS were were out there. Mm-hmm. And the guys, the, the, the men and women, I should say, that were... Um, programming AP, AUP, I believe they, they, they changed the format from sort of a traditional college station of playing, you know, educational programs or lectures and, and turned it into this free form thing, mm-hmm. which was uh, really a big, big thing, especially in those days at following Kent State. I mean, they had been doing it for a while, but um, it, it just introduced me to some things. And after that, I decided that I'd take some journalism classes at the university and had a radio show and um, met people, and it sort of catapulted me into something that I had no idea I'd be going into, you know, right. journalism, right. radio, yeah. all that. We've talked in the past on the show about um, those sort of glory days of freeform radio, which I think a lot of people... You have to be a certain age to even know what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, at one time it was like radio was, there were top 40 stations that played the hits. There were, you know, country and R&B stations and, you know, very genre ori- oriented. And then classical stations, some jazz stations, um, uh, which actually sounds like a great thing today compared to how a lot of radio yeah. now is. You know, is. talk radio didn't even exist, right? Right. It was very rare and <laughs> yeah. very, very late at night and yeah. very kooky. But um, somewhere in that 1968 to 1969 era, moving on, and really, I would say to the mid 70s at most, there was this radio that existed on FM where there was it was like you never knew what the programming was going to be. You were really surprised by the music. I think that's a cool thing about the summit today. This is one of the. This is the only station I can think of that you really never know what you're going to hear if you turn it on. It can be some incredible new song or some like vintage thing from you know the 60s that you haven't thought about or heard in a long time brad we it, haven't heard any sun Ra yeah, in, yeah. In, in how long you know yeah we need yeah <laughs> maybe sometime in the 
midnight to 3 uh, a.m. Uh, <laughs> programming. But anyway, that, not to get off topic, but uh, yeah, that, that had to be a formative time for you to be involved in that because it was so creative. Well, there, there were some examples um, of stations doing that. Uh, WCLV mm-hmm. had a program called WCLV Saturday Night, Robert Conrad, and it was a mixture of folk, comedy, jazz, you know, rock, uh, classical, mm-hmm. and then Martin Perlick. Oh, the Perlick okay, Project. Yeah. The Perlick Project. Yeah, Martin yeah. Perlick started something there called the Perlick Project and then moved to NCR, I believe. And he was, in my book, the best oh. DJ I ever heard in my life mm-hmm. because he would do that and he was very knowledgeable. I mean, he ended up out in LA and he has an archive of his interviews with mm. classical music. Uh, conductors and musicians and stuff, but he knew a lot about classical music and everything. But it was that just throw everything against the wall, comedy, and, and then you know the Dillards and then Beatles and Stones and <laughs> yeah. Bob and Ray. I mean, uh-huh. <laughs> that's what I liked. Right, right, that kind of range. Yeah, yeah. So talking about music, what is the earliest music you remember getting into? Oh, I uh, probably. Um, my sister had a transistor radio before I did, and she was two years older than me. And she, I was listening to her little red transistor radio, and we were listening <laughs> Everyone always to remembers the yeah, color of these. We were listening to uh, <laughs> my blue Sylvania, you know, uh, top forty at uh-huh. the time, and it was a lot of doo wop. Uh-huh. Uh, and then um, uh, I wasn't sure, Jim. I thought it was going to be like someone beating a rock with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's what I was listening to, and I, like everybody else, got turned on to uh, the Beatles and the um, British Invasion, mm-hmm. and I, I kind of got very into Stax, Volt, uh, R&B, yeah. and, um, you know, I just gobbled it up, mm-hmm. um, and like m- hundreds, 100 million other people, or 50 million other baby boomers. Do you think that um, music plays played a different role in your life and our lives people that say grew up in the in the 60s and 70s maybe even going to the 80s and it does now i think that it's just as important now um you know i mean i don't want to say our music was better because i believe that young people are into music as big as anybody else Mm -hmm. i just you know it's different a different um, universe of music, and but it sure it sure was important for my generation. What was know? more focused? I mean, I mean, there were the distractions of video games and and uh, you know cell phones and the internet didn't exist, so it was pretty. It was a lot narrower for us. Well, there's a lot of content that's vying for people's attention yeah, yeah, now yeah, in all kinds great. of different areas. Um, I guess what I always think is that. Like at least when I was growing up, it like like what music you were into kind of like was it being part of how you defined yourself. I don't I don't think I think like people yeah, kids now kids today I sound so old, but it's <laughs> yeah. like it, I I mean I agree with you. There's a ton of great music out there, and I and and I just not sure that 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 most to, to most young people it's like if you like this music or you like that music they might say well that's corny or this is awesome, but. You know, I mean, it turned. I mean, it was a thing of just even what genre you listened to, right? I mean, it was like, oh, you like those bands? Well, you know, you, you stink. You know, I mean, which in a way is dumb. I'm not saying it's not. It's probably better now, really. Well, it was. It was more. I think it was more of a communal thing then, because you couldn't hear it on the radio. They weren't playing deep cuts from Revolver on the radio, for right, example, right. or everything on Blonde on Blonde. It was only, you know, whatever. Uh, Rainy day women. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, two stories. Uh, I caddied when I was in high school, and I was a caddy at Portage Country Club, and a couple of my other friends were caddying at Fairlawn. And one day, one of the guys, we were hanging out in the evening after all of us had worked our buns off on the <laughs> golf course. And he goes, Hey, did you hear that uh, Dylan has a new record and it's got two albums in it? And it's called Blonde on Blonde and Giant Tiger 
which was a discount yeah, store, that's right. is selling it for two ninety five, <laughs> and so we all went out there and bought wow. it. We were like, "Oh man, they made a huge mistake. How can they be selling two albums for that much?" <laughs> that's you you're one. pulling one off, and we all here. listened to it together. <laughs> mm-hmm. The other one is when when Revolver came out, a a, a girl that I graduated high school with lived in our neighborhood and she bought the album Mm -hmm. and my friend chuck and i and some other people sat on her porch a screened in porch that had an electrical outlet (laughs) and she had her little uh phonograph there and we listened to the revolver Mm -hmm. and you know it was a shared thing like sitting around a campfire you were the the second guest we've had here that uh caddied at portage myron did the same thing he bought his first car why well, I, I bought a Gibson uh, J forty five at uh, Frankie Reynolds Music. Oh wow! A, star, a sunburst guitar <laughs> that now I gave to my son and his wife. But <laughs> I bought that for one hundred and forty bucks. Uh, I made it caddying. New. Yep, uh, brand new, <laughs> great guitar. <laughs> So this is From Akron and Beyond. I'm Bob Ethington with my co-host, Nick Nicholas. We're talking to our special guest, Mr. Jim Carney. Now, you know, as you've probably gathered from listening to us uh, thus far, uh, we're all old friends, and I go back with Jim. Um, I'm thinking somewhere in the very late 80s, sounds right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, and we've been very good, very good friends ever since. And one aspect of your life is, that has always interested me, because y- y- you never really talk about it that much, to me anyway, is your photography. Mm-hmm. And um, and there's some great photos. Jim loves to give photos for gifts. And I, and I actually have practically a little gallery of Jim, Jim <laughs> Carney in my house. But, I mean, some of these photos, like from New York City, like that look mm-hmm. like they're from the 60s. I mean, there's, there's the Cafe Wa, mm-hmm. that one that you gave me. I <laughs> love that photo. How old were you, and what brought you there, and how did that happen? Well, I, I was a documenter, kind okay. of, as a kid. You know, uh-huh. and I, I, my dad uh, had a Pentax camera, and I was really curious about it. And one Christmas, it was probably when I was about ninth grade, maybe, 63, um, he got me a... a a, a can to develop film okay. and a little small and larger and I started developing film mm-hmm. and I loved it you know and what I loved about it was more of the journalistic thing and I didn't yeah. know I would be an, end up doing what I did uh, right. you know work at the newspaper forever uh-huh. but I liked to uh, collect images of stuff yeah. you know and I used my brother Ralph as a as a um he was my model a lot of times. I mean, him and his friends, yeah. when they were playing in the neighborhood, I documented those kids. But I just love, I still like to do it. Mm-hmm. That's why I love having an iPhone that has a camera on it. I, I take, a, I don't know, a half dozen pictures a day, mostly nature stuff now. I see your Instagram postings on It's fun. I, I love it. I mean, and I also, I worked at the newspaper for 35 years. And, I, I, you know, we would go out on, as a reporter, and we would go out on stories with photographers and I watched these people Man. and you know how they did it and they were all so good and watched how they the eye that they had what they would see and and I think that might have helped me in my own reporting and writing you know mm-hmm. um but uh I just I just like it I I have a Nikon digital camera I haven't used in years because of my phone right right so yeah, yeah but I, I it's a big part of me Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you have my little the little gallery of my little pictures. <laughs> yeah. I've decided though that I used to I used to mat I charge stuff. people to see it. I used to mat <laughs> pictures up, but lately I've been making uh, cards out of pictures. Mm-hmm. It's a little easier. You don't have to stick it on a wall. Nobody right. wants more stuff on their walls anymore. <laughs> I think. So how when were you in New York City? I went to New York City um, for a week, and this is a good story for a week. Senior year with uh, my friend Robert, who's still my best friend, moved back to Akron from D.C. recently, and David, who I'm still very good buddies with, and a couple other guys. We went to New York City over spring break because David's grandmother lived there, and so I'd never been there, and Robert had been there because he lived in Albany Uh when he was up to about fourth grade, and he'd been to the city, and David had because his grandmother lived there. So we drove his father's uh, Ford Fairlane. 
into <laughs> New York City and stayed at his grandma's one night. And then Robert and I went and spent the five nights at the Sloan House YMCA, <laughs> oh, wow. which was a heck of an experience. And we would get together and, you know, I, I had my dad's camera. I had one roll of film. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I took about maybe a roll, but I lost almost every negative except the Cafe Wa. Oh, I took a picture of a guy standing out in front of Cafe Wa and a couple others. Um, but uh, the the most important part of the news out of this one is uh, one night David said, "Hey, um, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention are playing at." a club in Greenwich Village. Do you guys want to go? And David and this guy, Todd, and another guy, Randy, went, and Robert and I said, no, we, we've decided we're gonna, we want to ride the subway all night. <laughs> and we did, and we rode the subway all night and missed the mothers. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. It missed the mothers, and they're like, oh, my God, you guys missed it. And I, I, I did miss it, but it was awesome riding the subway. <laughs> 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 but I did lose all. I, I took a picture uh, uh, while I was there of a uh, newsstand, which is interesting because there was a a guy buying a newspaper. I might have given you that one, Bob. Mm-hmm. But there's a guy buy, uh, getting a newspaper in his hand, and they used to have newsstands in the city everywhere, everywhere, and including downtown Akron. Mm-hmm. And it was a black and white fuzzy picture I, I printed. The quality wasn't so hot, but I lost the negative, and I had one image that I keep repeating and editing and giving to people. Uh-huh. Yes, it is a good photo. Yeah, <laughs> that was, yeah It's kind of heartbreaking you lost those negatives, though, huh? I have no idea. I, you know, I've, I saved just about everything. I have no idea where they went. Yeah. Um, yeah. One, of the, one of the images that I took around the, that time, a little later, was uh, turned out to be the uh, cover for Michelle Branch's, my daughter-in-law's, mm-hmm. album okay. that came out the, uh, last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a beach scene, and I lost that negative too. <laughs> there's a, there's a pattern, yeah. and it was a black and white picture of people on a beach. And Michelle's like, "Oh my god, I love that picture. Can I use it on my cover?" I said, "Sure. I don't have a, I have a fuzzy picture, and that's what she liked about it. It was uh-huh. a little dreamy like that. Right. That's cool. That's cool. So we've talked about your college radio days, yep. um, but you. I'm really not sure the chronology of this. You you then continued in radio, yeah, yeah. and that and then, and was that? Well, tell you tell. All me. right, <laughs> I I I I went to work at a radio station in Southern Ohio, okay, uh, Ironton, or as you say in 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 Ironton, Arton, W I R O, right on the Ohio River, a little AM station. I my mom, we had friends whose. Uh, they had friends whose brother... And when would this be? This was in 71, fall okay. of 71. And her, her brother, my mother's friend's brother, had this radio station, an AM station. And my mom said, hey, uh, Liz says that they're looking for somebody down there uh, to work, to run the board and you know do some news in the morning. And yeah. so I, I called the guy and sent him a tape, and I got hired down there. And I worked for about six months. Then I moved to Toledo and I bopped around at four stations over about two and a half years. Mm-hmm. Was by that time doing news only, yeah. and then I came back to Akron in '74 and was at WHLO at the time. They were going to all news and talk, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, they had a huge. They were building a new big news staff at the time, and um, I stayed there until I went to the Beacon in '79. Okay, okay, it was wonderful. Yeah. You know, I was walking around the studio here, and it reminded me of uh, one of the stations I worked at was in the Commodore Perry Hotel in Toledo on about the seventh floor. It was an AM station called WTTO, and I was there for about three months, and there was a guy that was an on-air jock that lived in the main lounge. He had his clothes hung up like on a... <laughs> he was drying his clothes out there. And one day, the, the general manager gathers us up, up together and says, uh, you know, the station's been sold, All every man for himself. It was sort of like that, <laughs> yeah. the meaning of life from Monty Python, you know. The plant's been closed, you know, you're all being sold for medical reasons. So we all, you know, we all we all took off. But it was, it was a great time, and I, I you know, I loved 
those days. And I mm-hmm. liked putting programs together and, and slicing tape and, mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So you went from radio to newspapers. Yeah. First of all, how did that happen? And what, what did you? I know you worked for years for the Akron Beacon mm-hmm. Journal. Is that where you went originally? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I was the news director at HLO, mm-hmm. and I was knowing. I knew more and more people that were at the Beacon, uh-huh. and I was interested in doing longer stories. And um, you know, they were encouraging me. Why don't you go down and talk to? Paul Poorman, who was the editor of the mm-hmm. paper. And I called him up, and he said, come on down. And I talked to him, and they uh, had me try out. And I did a little three-day tryout, and I got hired. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the greatest day of my life. I, I loved the work, you know. Yeah. So, But I loved the, doing the radio thing, too. You really um, were in working in newspapers sort of like, at, at their at their height, and but yeah. also as they kind of began dissipating, right? Yeah, yeah, which yeah. They be heartbreaking, they, I would think. Absolutely. I mean, there was no internet, obviously, right. and you know, the, the Beacon Journal was part of a very big corporate entity called Knight Ritter mm-hmm. that formed when Knight Newspapers that Akron was part of merged with the Ritter Papers. Anyway, they they were making a lot of money and hiring people and increasing their staff in, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Right. And everything was chugging along. And, I mean, we were sending two and three people to the political conventions. And, right. You right. know, we had a huge photo staff and mm-hmm. big editorial page staff. And I think we had four, I don't know, 180 or 165 people in the newsroom. Yeah. Not all reporters, but... You know, I left. By the time I left, there uh, there had been many um, buyouts. I left in 2014. Yeah. And the Knight Ritter had been sold, had sold itself in 2006. And a Canadian um, businessman named David Black bought mm-hmm. the paper. And um, actually, there weren't a lot of changes for a while, mm-hmm. but there were over time uh, buyouts and it was a heavily weighted o- older staff, mm-hmm, right. you know, and they weren't replacing it with a lot of younger people. Right. But I left in 2014. My wife, Katie Byard, worked there mm-hmm. uh, for longer than me. She left um, a couple of years ago. And by the time she left, they had already, they had they vacated the building yeah, at yeah. Exch- East Exchange and um, High, and um, you know, so we witnessed a lot. There's a lot of great people there working, trying to do the job, but. The problem is they don't have the money coming in. Right. You know, the the kiss of death was the classified ads going to um, Craigslist. Yes. Oh, sure. Right. That that right. was where the money, you know, the, that kind of thing. Yeah. And the big display ads that, you know, the yeah. department stores used to. But they're trying, and I don't know what's going to happen. I hope that daily papers can survive. Yeah. You know, the, a book that came out about three years ago, the University of Akron Press did on, on the Beacon Right, that was a great book. That pretty much tells, uh, you know, the, yeah. you know, from the height to the everything from John S. Knight to right to what what. It's happened. a great book. Yeah. Katie wrote a chapter, and I wrote a chapter yeah. in it too. Mm-hmm. I wrote about my radio days leading up. Yeah, to yeah, coming. that's where I. Yeah, and yeah. Katie wrote about the last day in the building, oh, wow. which was a great piece. Yeah. There's a great piece in there about uh, John S. Knight when his grand oh, uh, great. Yeah. When his grandson was murdered, yeah, and the Mary Etheridge, a very good friend, went to Detroit, went to uh, Boston to the hospital to see him after his grand uh, grandson was killed. But oh, yeah, it's a good good collection of stories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I happen to, as it turns out, I happen to have known a lot of people that worked for the Akron Beacon Journal and the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and um, uh, it is, you know, really striking and sad when you see photos of the newsroom from you know the heights you know and it's just packed with reporters people working it's just such a you know beehive of activity and you know it just be so different you know and and and, uh i mean everyone knows about the the uh tenuous situation of journalism these days Mm -hmm. and i think you know with the a paper like the beacon used to do the kind of coverage we now still associate with like 
the New York Times. Like you've covered international, national politics. Absolutely. Uh, and now it's like at least if we need have somebody that can cover local stuff. You well, know? Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> you know, um, the George Santos story, the guy that was elected yeah. to Congress, Great who story. really wasn't vetted very well <laughs> yeah, until right, after he clearly. was elected. Now, that's an understatement, right? But, I mean, back in the day, I covered local communities for a number of years, and there were editors, including the guy that I was the, uh, I don't know what his title was at the time. He he was, his name was Pat Englehart, and he over, was overseeing the Kent State coverage. When okay. When the, uh, when the uh, we won the Pulitzer Prize for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when, whenever he is, his thing was check out every candidate running, find out about them. Mm -hmm. Don't let this anything. I mean, he didn't say don't let George Santos happen, <laughs> right, but right. we knew that you couldn't, you had to check out every single person mm -hmm. and for, you know, a local school board race in Manchester or, um, you know, Coventry or, or whatever. And so that's a, that's a big loss. Yeah. That we don't have as many people yeah. knocking on the door of candidates to find out who they really are. Right. right. You remember that uh, one guy that was under the radar that when he brought a professional football team to Akron. Oh yeah. I can't think of his name right now, but he had like no, Akron nothing. Vulcans. Yeah. He had like nothing, you know, but he fooled a lot of people and the <sighs> team never even got the players that ever got paid. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot of value in having a good newspaper, and there's more and more towns that don't have papers at all. Right. Because they're closing. Right, right. It's sad. Um, well, speaking, of, again, of, of newspapers, I'd like to ask you just a little bit more about your career at The Beacon. I I associate you with features, with mm -hmm. writing sort of long, in-depth uh, uh, profiles of of individuals or stories about uh, you know, sort of historical uh, things that happened in Akron or or human interest stories, I guess, would be the one way to put it. Um, I'm kind of springing this on you, but is, are there two or three stories that come to mind that you're especially proud of? I yeah. mean, you did so much work there. It's, it might be hard to narrow it down, but I'm just curious. Well, there's, there's one story um, that I, you know, you want to, keep your ears open. And one of the beauties of being a newspaper reporter was anything, your workplace was kind of <clears throat> any road you drove down because you see, oh, what happened over there? Or what happened here? And I'm a little, little uh, short attention span theater <laughs> here. But a neighbor of ours told us about um, um, a school principal in a local school district that had taken his own life mm. and that he was a Vietnam vet. And okay. I I was very curious about it, and um, I found out who he was, and I talked to his surviving parents, and spent a lot of time running the story down. And uh -huh. um, it's a very very sad story. A guy that had severe PTSD mm -hmm. from Vietnam felt that he had been responsible for the deaths of some kids because mm. he was ordering bombing into uh, you know the jungle. Yeah. And uh, on the, it was around the time that the U.S. went into uh, uh, Bosnia and, you know, went under Clinton. Right. We, yeah. we went in. Yeah. And he, he took his own life. And I, that was one story that was pretty compelling. Another one, and this is just because it was so f interesting and it led to uh, the Black Keys connection, mm -hmm. was a story about Alfred McMoore. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah. And that was a that was a freelance thing I did for the magazine when we had, when they had a magazine, but mm -hmm. it was basically trying to find out who this outsider artist was. Mm -hmm. Was it was it uh, other than the Beacon Sunday magazine? It was another magazine. No, just it was only Be there. Yeah, it was only in there, and it was just sort of following this guy around for about a year mm -hmm. in two thousand. And yeah. the Black Keys didn't form. They they decided to form a band in two thousand one and decided to call the band the Black Keys mm -hmm. because of something this character, Alfred McMoore, may he rest in peace. Yes. He died in 2009. I love the guy. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, that story was really powerful for me because yeah. it was it was running down rabbit holes to try and, you know, I had to get permission to talk to psychiatrists, right. social workers, because this gentleman had a lot of mental health issues, but he was this genius uh, artist. Yeah. So that was one. Yeah. And then, I don't know, the last years of my life at the paper, I was writing about Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. And I did, I, I don't know, I, I think I covered about 
40 different men and women who were killed over there. There, yeah. there. I didn't go there. I just yeah. did this stuff at home and, mm-hmm. you know, stories about their funerals, stories about who these people were. Um, and when well, you're writing about the veterans uh, was always, I thought, very uh, revealing and uh, and very important. You did good work there. Well, thank you. Yeah, I thought it was really important. Um, I remember your your stories on uh, on the Twin Towers. You know, yeah, that, that was pretty intense. Well, after nine eleven, um, this is the day of nine eleven, the morning of nine eleven, as the towers are going down. The editor, my editor at the time, was named Ann Sheldon Mesker, and she said, can you find out about area reserve units and National Guard units? Is anybody being called up that uh-huh. day? And uh-huh. also, see if you can find any um, uh, Pearl Harbor survivors, Wow! Right, which I did, you know, and I found some Pearl Harbor survivors and turned a story around mm-hmm. for the next day's paper about them comparing it to yeah. what happened on 9-11. Right. And then after that, I went to, uh, followed a couple reserve units that got called up for, you know, stateside duty. They'd go and, and uh, protect army bases because right. we were paranoid about people blowing them up. Sure, right. And yeah. so, uh, you know, I did that. And mm-hmm. there was a young woman I met at one of the first ones, first, uh, I think it was at Fort Leonard Wood, um, who I met. She was very young, maybe 19, right in the, right in the reserve, I believe. And um, years later, I wrote about her again, and she had two or three tours overseas. Wow. And she later became, I think she became a cop, mm-hmm. a police officer. And now I think she might be a teacher. I'm not oh, sure. Wow. But, uh-huh. you know, there's, it's, that's been a long time, 20-some yeah. years. I remember sure. the, the first headlines after that uh, incident was um, the headlines of the beacon. Who did this? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Because no, nobody knew it. You know, it was so new. It was a it was a terrible time, and both Katie and I were working a lot of hours, and I mean, we just started falling asleep watching the coverage. And the thing that I went back to ni- back to Ground Zero a couple of years afterwards and did mm-hmm. a story about uh, Ground Zero, and I think it was two years after I went to Shanksville mm-hmm. and New York City, and people were still uh, hanging photos on. You know the fencing Fence. around Ground right. Zero, right, right. And right. went to uh, Shanksville, and which is where Flight 93 crashed mm-hmm. in the middle of near Somerset, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And at that time, there was no memorial. There was a makeshift fence, mm-hmm. and there was ephemera that people had left there. You know, baseballs. <laughs> let's let's roll. <laughs> baseball caps, flags. Yeah. You know, powerful stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just a tragedy. Yeah. Well, and we're still living in the aftermath of that. We are. Right? Yeah. We are. So this is From Akron and Beyond, and I am Bob Ethington with my co-host, Nick Nicholas, and our guest today is Jim Carney. Now, uh, Jim, a, a, a couple of names have come up uh, in conversation here that I think we need to uh, pursue a little more uh, thoroughly. And the first one is the name Ralph. Ralph Carney, your brother. Um, that is uh, uh, actually kind of a main connection between me and Jim is because I knew Ralph really before I knew you uh, because Ralph was playing with the band Tin Huey, uh, playing saxophone amongst other instruments. And, um, uh, and I, you know, anyone who ever saw Ralph play n- knows that he was just a charismatic uh, figure and, and so fun to watch and such a, Terrific, innovative musician, and uh, left an impression and, on many lives. Yes, definitely. And uh, I got to know him very well, and we played you know together some at that time, and then over the years. And uh, um, but it, just from that, I mean, you and I ended up kind of uh, you know we don't need to rehash all my relationship with you, but we kind of met up at when I was working at the West Hill Library, now the Highland Square Library. And, of course, then, you know, it was like I mentioned that I knew your brother, and I kind of immediately took off from there. But um, I know that you still feel the loss of Ralph because it was so sudden and awful. But, uh, you know, no one knew him probably any better than you. And I, I'd just like you to talk about your brother and <coughs> your, your, your your memories of him yeah. as a kid and <laughs> just from there. Well, um, 
You know, Ralph was uh, a born to be on stage, uh, you know, from when he was a little kid. And he was orchestrating little uh, events with his friends. And that's some of the things I was documenting, you know. Mm -hmm. But he was just an interesting boy. And I was six plus years older than him. So I babysat him a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I watched him as he got into music. He he got into the music I was listening to Mm -hmm. because he was a kid. You know, and I was a college kid or high school kid, and so he, 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 there was some, you know, respect of my music. And then I yeah. it turned around because I then started listening to the stuff he was listening to mm-hmm. because he was way more hip to what was important <laughs> than me. And, you know, but anyway, he, I would, I played a lot of uh, bluegrass and different things like that. And that's when he got involved in the banjo was his first instrument. And he played well, that I, for I about didn't a know year. that. Me neither. Yeah. 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 He played a banjo for about a year. He still, I think he still had one or mm-hmm. still played. And then he got turned on by a uh, jazz saxophone mm-hmm. and, you know, took off from there. And you say, you know, I probably know him better. I, I certainly know aspects of him, but I mean, I, he didn't live, I didn't live in the same city of, of as he did for years and years and years. Right. And uh, the thing that uh, Ralph died in December, 2017. Mm-hmm. Wow. And to this day, and he was on, he played as a side man for a zillion bands. Right. right? Yeah. And you know, one cut here, one cut there. And I'm still finding out about bands that he, where he, he contributed a 10 second. Right. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I find mostly through Facebook mm-hmm. and through his page, there's people like he still has an active, Facebook page and people will weigh in on something and I'll uh-huh. message them. In fact, today I'm mailing two of my photographs of Ralph to a couple of people that played with him years ago, wow. but he was an interesting kid yeah. and loved uh, cartoons and frightening cartoons. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, and he was just uh, creative as hell. And he, <laughs> he was, I thought he would be a visual artist because mm-hmm. he was that yeah. good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, uh, Really enjoyed getting to know him and our bands. You know, Bizarro's and Tin Huey did a lot of shows together, but I also had him on the Clone Records label with Tin, you know, with the Tin Huey releases. But he also did a solo uh, record for me on Bowling Balls Volume One called Closet Bears that uh, was also it turned out to uh, it was requested uh, by Dave Thomas and Pierubu to be on the Pierubu box set because Dave Thomas sang on it. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up because you were talking about cuts of ban- uh, from bands. That Closet Bears is the epitome of Ralph. Uh. You know, um, the the lyrics, everything about it. Um, you know, but but Ralph. Uh, after Ralph died, I um, I I was really losing it, and because he was the last person in my birth family to be alive, other than me, and I. My, uh, I went to our minister at Fairlawn West UCC, and I just was struggling. And she said, you know, you're a writer. You should just write. Why don't you write your story? Mm-hmm. And I did that. I started writing about losing my brother. Yeah. I wrote 230 pages. Wow. Only gave it to a few friends and my mm-hmm. kids. And I don't know if anybody ever read it, but it helped me. And my advice is to anybody that can do that, if it's a great way of processing uh, the loss mm-hmm. and... You know, I, I, it took me to a lot of places where I was remembering really cool things about him, right. you know, his, his childhood. And uh, anyway, that's a, a plug for writing uh, about your lost people. Right. And just doing it for yourself, yeah. right? Not, yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. you know, yeah. gee, I hope this gets published or no. something. Yeah, it's just to do it for yourself. Did Ralph talk much about his, uh, you know, his ventures with uh, the B fifty twos and well, you know, yeah, well, he the would, other the, yeah. The well, his um, he did like Jim says. Ralph did work with, I mean, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of different but he recordings about and artists. That he, that he well, he was out. one of the well, the one that would probably undoubtedly stands out the most is Tom Waits. Yeah, yeah. And um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that. He um, played on some very pivotal, pivotal, <laughs> pivotal uh, Tom Waits albums, uh, Swordfish Trombones and uh, Rain Dogs. Oh, and, right. um, 
in uh, Frank's Wild Years. And uh, that was where Waits really changed his uh, style dramatically from kind of like the sort of, you know, boozy, uh, Bukowski jazz poet guy at the piano to somebody who was doing some really interesting, pretty avant-garde music, but that songs, you know, because Waits is such a great songwriter, the songs were so strong that they could hold up the structure of being played, you know, on, you know, people banging on pots and marimbas and accordions and, you know, guitars and stuff. And Ralph fit into that music perfectly because that's exactly the kind of creativity he had. Well, you know, that's, uh, that's interesting when you mention about the pots and pans because when I did a couple clone record nights in New York and I needed a, th- you know, it was, you got, you know, the unit, uh, unit five and, uh, uh, hammer damage, but I needed a third band and, uh, everybody fell through. So I, I got a hold of Ralph and he put, uh, some guys together from the apartment building where he lived, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, they call themselves clong farben. I think that's the way you pronounce it. With it. <laughs> and, uh, they banged on pots and pans and he, Ralph did these great, solos and lo and behold uh the review of clone record site in the new york times just sort of mentioned a unit five and hammer damages but loved clong farben <laughs> i mean that, that's typical you yeah know? yeah this thing he puts together you know in like half an hour to pay the rent it was a, a rent <laughs> thing you know like a rent party yeah you know when ralph got hooked up with tom waits that was such a big deal for him it was pivotal for him yeah and he was with the band for I think 10, 12 years. Really? He, mm-hmm. Yeah. He played with them through sometime in the late 90s from 85-ish or something like that. Sounds right. Yeah. Um, I remember getting a hold of a cassette of uh, Rain Dogs and mm-hmm. listening to it on a long drive. And, you know, it was just blew my mind that mm-hmm. Ralph was playing on, on this sure. band. And, yeah. and it was different. You know, Waits went in a different direction with that right. record. You but, know what's interesting too. We got to mention, Bob. You got to talk about this when um, the Black Keys, either their first or their second show, wound up opening for a band that Ralph was in at uh, at the Beachland. But you got to describe that because that was it was and was that the only time that that uh, uncle and nephew got to play together? Which wait, what, tell me about. Oh, uh, it, it, Bob, yeah. <laughs> well, it was the. I was probably there. It was, yeah. You were. I'm. I'm. I'm sure you were. It was um, at the Beachland, and actually, this is where how I ended up playing with Tin Huey was because Ralph would come into town usually, like in the fall, uh, and mm-hmm. and to visit family and friends here in Akron, and um, he uh, was coming in one time, and it was like he wanted to put together like a show. He like to play at the Beachland Tavern. And so um, uh, he asked me if I'd play if I, if I'd play drums or, or, or in percussion, and I said, "Yeah, sure." And so it ended up being essentially guys from Tin Huey and Ralph, um, and and uh, Stuart Austin, the drummer of Tin Huey. He 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 was there, so I kind of moved off to playing more like percussion. And um, uh, anyway, so we it, this was just this impromptu thing. Like we literally, it, this is very Ralph. It was like the night before we all got together at somebody's house and just kind of, we didn't even really, I don't think we even had the instrument set up. He just basically like, was like, okay, we're going to do this, you know, and he'd sing this little thing. And then there was just vamp on that. And we'll kind of jam on it. And then it was like, uh, um, he, Willie, the pimp, the song mm-hmm. by Frank Zappa. He mm-hmm. was like, uh, I have a version of that. It's, we'd kind of just do it like reggae. Okay. We'll play it like that. That was the rehearsal. I mean, there was no real playing through it, practically anything, maybe just like a minute of a song. And okay, that's enough, you yeah, know. Yeah. And that's what I loved about playing with Ralph was his spontaneity, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah, you can do that when you're as creative as he is. Yeah. So anyway, we um, go go to play at the Beachland Tavern, and it's like, oh, yeah, my... My nephew's band's going to open for us, and so yeah, and nobody I, knew who they were. Yeah, and and it's like, and I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know. 
And so, of course, it was. It turned out that that was the Black Keys. So it was, you know, his nephew, your son, Patrick Carney, and uh, that Dan was their Auerbach. first or second gig, very early. And show. just within the mm-hmm. last month or so, that somebody recorded that and got released on a special vinyl. Yeah, and so that's out there. Yeah, it, it and um, uh, I think it was a record store day thing. Yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, I had to get a copy of it, of course, and it took me back to that to that show. They were raw, but they had the energy, mm-hmm. and they oh, had yeah. the and they had you know the the qualities that would make them huge in a few years were there already. But anyway, it, it, it was it's funny. That's one of the few things like I'm able to say you know that makes like my musical career sound impressive, <laughs> like. Like we, I played with Tin Huey at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so I can say I played Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I played the Akron Civic Theater, and we played in New York at Danceteria. Oh yeah, and the Black Keys opened for me <laughs> one time. <laughs> yeah, that was a great show too. There were like thirty people there. Yeah, right. But yeah. It was a fun show. Yeah, but everyone was there, loved it. <laughs> well, the, the, the early Everybody days formed a band. The yeah. early <laughs> days of the Black Keys were really interesting. Um, the first show I saw of theirs was at the Beachland in the Tavern. And, yeah. you you know, um, Nick, you talk about 30 people. I think there might have been 10 or 12. I don't know how many people, mm, maybe 20. A lot. But there was a table full of dentists, old middle-aged <laughs> dentists there. And I, I you know, my, I think this is one show I took my dad to. Uh. And I, I went up and I was talking to these guys. I said, well, what brought you up here? And really, they weren't known at all. They were being played on a few radio stations, APS, The Summit, and a few others. And he said, uh, the one guy goes, yeah, you know, uh, I heard about this band and I called my friends. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of the music from when we were uh, we were young uh, young dudes, you know. Yeah. And I said, yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> but you know the 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 first shows were amazing um and i who who could have ever predicted what would have happened um, to them Not who me. could no uh, well if a story that i like to tell that i don't know if you remember this or not jim but i i remember i probably it. don't cuz I, I am have, heading for a memory i, unit, so. I remember it quite well is i was working at the main library i was the head of a department down there the uh, audio visual department so we had all the music and the movies and stuff and you would come in on a kind of semi regular basis, yeah. you know, just uh, mainly just to stop it, you know, do some research or whatever at the mm-hmm. library. But oh, you'd always pay me a vi- visit when you did it. And I remember we were talking, and you were like, Yeah, man, I'm really concerned about Patrick because he's talking about not going to college. And <laughs> he's, he's, he, and he, this he wants, is absolute he, truth. He, oh, he, wa- he, wants to, he wants to like to produce music or something. And, I just don't know. I mean, I'm like, what? I'm telling him, well, you can do that and still go to school and stuff. And, and I remember, you know, giving the kind of stage advice that you give to another <laughs> yeah. parent, you know, which I was like, well, maybe you should just let him do it. And if, you know, it'll probably all fizzle out and then he'll go, you can always go back to college, you know, this, you know, give it a year or something or whatever. It's kind of funny how that turned oh, out. Well, you know, there was another incident and, and this was, this was in like the winter of O2 and they had, they had recorded their record, mm. and it was being produced by a live natural sound. The they come up. The, the, yeah. yeah. And my dad was still alive, and my, Katie and my dad and uh, Patrick was working at Gasoline Alley. Mm. Uh, and so we went out there to get, grab a sandwich, and Pat came out. And he says, Dad, I think I'm, I I'm going to quit, and I just, we just have to give everything to the band. And I'm like being such a nerdy nerd, 50s father, like, oh, God, I'm, we're, oh, no, I don't know. Yeah, that's cool, but, oh, how are we going to? And my father, you know, uh, says, I think he should do it. I'm like, ah. yes, and he did it. But I love to tell that because I think, you know, now I have, my kids all have, uh, two of them have little kids, and I wondered what they would say, mm-hmm. you know, and I think, you, you know, you've, it's, and, and my dad was in a position as the grand elder statesman at the time to have helicopter vision and know you've got to do this. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, that was a pivotal moment for the band because if they hadn't done that, I don't think any, I don't think any of the good stuff would have happened because right. they needed to tour. Right. And a lot of great bands don't, and they, they need to, they worked their butts off. Yeah, and they, they did. Spent a, they well, did. Life, many lifetimes in that van. Yeah. And I don't regret, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to say this on the record. I don't regret, <laughs> that I had fatherly, oh, uh, you know, no, angst over it. Would yeah, 
the good, <laughs> but, fa- good father. But, you know, the thing is, I think, and not, not to put myself on the therapist couch, but I think one of the reasons I, I gave you that advice, and I don't know how it was for you, Nick. We've never talked about this, but I had nothing but resistance from my parents about doing music. And it really caused a lot of, like, strife in our relationship for, like, a pretty prolonged period of time because, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in Unit mm-hmm. 5. I wanted to be a musician. And they just never any support at all about that. Anytime, I, I couldn't even stand it when they'd call me, you know, and, and I, hi, Mom, how are you? And it would be like, you know. Oh, I'm fine. Are you still in that band? Oh, and then weird. this whole thing about, you know, it's an avocation, not a vocation. And I remember one of my favorite things was she said once, or my or my dad maybe said it, but it was like, what happens if you lose an arm? What are you going to do then? Is it a drum one? I'm like, well, that could cause problems in all kinds of things I might be doing. I think the last thing I'd worry about is drumming. <laughs> Yes. Uh, dude, that's one of the best things I've ever that's heard. a great line yeah. but but nick did you get support from your parents oh no it's, i i was much older i had my I had my degree and was working and so it was beyond that yeah yeah, yeah. and you always were working the whole time you were doing that yeah too. yeah i never yeah. was brave enough to maybe we would have gone further if i would have uh, been like terry in my band you know yeah i remember he he uh when we uh got our record contract we we're gonna go on tour in england which didn't happen but uh, every he was the only one who quit his job, and, and, and you know we weren't going to go, but he still never went back to work. <laughs> Terry was going to quit his job anyway. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> well, the the you know the the thing is after that, people I I get people ask me questions, and I've been interviewed a lot because of Pat, and you know I tell that story because <clears throat> you know uh, it's important to like you wanted to. It's important to do that and try it. You have to try it. And not just give it a, you know, go to the batting cage one time. You have to try it. Yeah. And who knows what will happen and how your life will change. And and if you didn't do it, what would have happened? Right, exactly. You know? So, um, yeah, and the key to all of that, as you've mentioned, is that, uh, you know, and Nick has mentioned as well, is that, you know, Dan and Pat, you know, they really worked really, really hard. Very so, hard. you know, their, their success comes... Uh, well deserved. Well, this has been from Akron and Beyond. Our guest tonight tonight <laughs> has been uh, Jim Carney, uh, a good friend and a guy who I think represents Akron well. Very well. Had a lot of great well. stories, and we appreciate very much your being on the show thank, with us. Thank, thank you for you, the Jim. opportunity, thank you, guys. Jimmy. Thank you. It's great being with you. And we'll see you next time.